This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at one of the hot smartphones for 2013. This is the LG G2. They've dropped the Optimus from the name. This is their mainstream size phone by Android st standards. It is. It's about the same size as the Samsung Galaxy S4, the HTC One, but what you get here is a 5.2 inch display, full HD IPS, stunning display. And on the back, it's your choice of black or white, really like a dark blue, genuine style plastic here. Not too thick nice in the hand. We're going to look at it now. This is the LG G2 finally here, finally available on a couple of US carriers coming to more. As you can see, it's not that huge a phone, right? Fitting in my hand. Granted, I have large hands, but pretty comfortable. What are you going to notice next? Well, if you take a look around the phone, there's no side buttons. This is the LG G2's thing, if you want to call it that. Every phone has to have something. And in this case, LG said, you know, we want to make this screen as big as possible. We want to make this a 5 inches kind of size phone, 4.7 to 5 inches, but we don't want to give up anything in terms of design and make it a wider phone. So you see, it's almost bezel-less. Look at the side edges. That edge-to-edge that -edge thing is really neat when you're watching videos, but they had to remove the side buttons to do that. And they said, ergonomically, most of us hold our hand and phone like this with the finger back here. So that's where they put the controls, right back here. Volume up, volume down, power button is in the middle. And your camera is up here, up top, as you would expect it. 13 megapixel camera up there, LED flash. Little branding down here, the G2, and you can see this is your usual shiny Korean style plastic. It, it has to be a cultural thing, right? Because us Americans, we complain about the shiny plastic thing, but the Korean companies, Samsung and LG, keep turning them out. There's a little subtle pattern here that makes it look kind of a little metallic and shiny, and it picks up fingerprints like crazy. As glossy things go, it's not so super slippery, in part because they did a nice job with this bevel here. Narrow is enough so that you can actually get a good hand grip around it when you're holding it, but thick enough that it kind of gets into your palm a bit, fills it, so it doesn't just come sliding back out. While we're looking at the bottom, here's your 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and your USB, micro USB port. So that's the thing, though. Back to the buttons right there. It's kind of weird, right? I, I, LG thinks that that's a selling point. I think that that's something that all of you are going to wonder about and going to watch reviews and read reviews to see if it's an annoyance or not. And I can tell you, largely, it actually works pretty well, and I like it. It's tactile enough because it raises up. You can see there's a little up point here, and you can feel that little power button that you know what your fingers are on. So it's pretty obvious as you're sliding back and forth. The volume buttons could be a little bit more tactile, a little bit more clicky, but not too, too bad. So I don't actually hate it. I Honestly, when I'm using the phone often, especially because I change phones frequently, I'm looking to see exactly where the side controls are anyway when I need to change my volume. So this is pretty obvious and easy to use. When is it not great? When you're watching videos because you hold it in landscape mode, right? And so then... It, this does not fall in a particularly natural position. That's when I really like having my volume controls right here, so it's pretty easy, up and down, up and down. No, i got to feel around the back and do this, or use the on-screen volume controls. Taking a look at the front face again, it's dominated by this wonderful 5.2-inch IPS Full HD display. Really stunning display. It keeps the colors even off angle. It doesn't turn too blue. You lose just a little bit of brightness, but it's pretty much your standard IPS 180 degree viewing angle experience. Color balance on this is very good and very accurate. Usually smartphones are all over the planet, or if it's a Samsung phone, they let you choose from several different ones, many of which are skewed from reality in terms of color balance. This one is just really nicely done. It's in fact a little bit better than the HTC One that has kind of pinkish whites. LG even has, well, among their million software features, you can zoom out if you just want to see your pretty picture. So there you get an idea of just how nice that display is. I, it's an odd feature. I don't know why they have it. Maybe in case it's your favorite photo of your kid or something you want to show somebody quickly and easily. But you get the idea. Stunning display. Certainly a selling point in the fact that it's 5.2 inches. You think, how much of a difference does it make? Now, versus the Samsung Galaxy S4 that's 5 inches, not a huge difference other than the fact that coming out to the edges just makes it feel and look really cool. But if you talk about the HTC One or the Moto X, those are 4.7 inches and you've gained a half an inch of screen real estate across diagonally, so it does make a difference. The other thing that's cool about this phone is it has a Snapdragon 800 CPU inside. That's the latest, greatest quad-core CPU clocked at 2.26 gigahertz. Crazy there with Adreno 330 graphics. Now, as you know, I've said in the Moto X review that phones are getting faster than we really need them to be. 
Do we need that much horsepower on a phone? No. But if you're buying this on a two-year contract and you're not the kind of person that goes and trades in their phone and upgrades sooner than that, then you, you know you've got something that's going to be really fast, even a year, two years down the road. So yes, this is a very fast CPU. It's holding its own against the Tegra 4 nicely, which so far in this country we've only seen in the NVIDIA Shield when it comes to the handheld form factor. Wickedly fast. Where it does make a difference is in things like the HDR feature and the camera, which requires a lot of processing power. It does HDR really without the delay you usually see on smartphones. Also, LG can throw all sorts of software and UI enhancements in this. Just look at this. See the, how the icons are actually dragging and they're doing that barn door kind of effect. You can choose different effects and here it's telling you you can add more stuff to that screen if you do it slowly. It does this all zippy, fast. It's just amazing. It doesn't get bogged down even though there's a whole lot of stuff going on here software-wise. So there's one use for your overpowered CPU. Certainly Samsung with the Galaxy S4 and its kitchen sink worth of software needs that CPU. And even the Galaxy S4, as we know, bogs down in a way that this doesn't. And that's one of the things I actually like about LG. They do a lot of the same software features. You could call it copying. For example, they have the same feature where they use the front camera to keep an eye on you and it won't turn off the screen if you're looking at it. If you look away when you're playing a video, you can set it to pause the video when you do that. Uh, there's motion control stuff. So if, if the phone starts ringing and you put it up to your ear, you can have it automatically answer. And that works, you know, okay, the timing of when it actually answers the call is a little hit or miss, sometimes a little too soon, a little too late, but all sorts of features going on here, none of them are bogging down the phone. When it comes to performance, this screen just says it all right there, max out, exclamation point, it is. This is 3D Mark for Android, and usually for, for smartphones we run the standard ice storm test and you can see it says it's too darn fast to really get reliable results we're just maxing out everything so we have to move up to the extreme test to get a result and there we scored a 9803 now that's a very nice and very high number but it's a little bit hard to compare since on our other phones we've been running it at the standard level rather than extreme on quadrant it scored 19,762 that is twice what the Moto X scores just to give you an idea and our Samsung Galaxy S4 and HTC One, both running on the Snapdragon 600 CPU, those scored around 12,250 each, so certainly even faster. And I don't know anybody that says that their HTC One is too slow, so take that for what it's worth, but clearly you've got the fastest going here. On Tutu, 32,990. I've not seen this score anything like that. This is even beating the Tegra 4 so far, like I said, in our NVIDIA Shield. Sun Spider 823 using the standard WebKit web browser. This comes with both Chrome and the older WebKit web browser. And the WebKit web browser tends to be a little bit faster than Chrome, generally speaking, for benchmarks. And for our 3D Mark score, well, you're seeing it on screen here already. And the demo test and extreme mode was 46.8 frames per second. So stunningly fast on paper, too, synthetically speaking. So now you're saying to yourself, okay, 5.2 inch full HD display, insanely fast processor, that's probably faster than some laptop CPUs from five years ago. Uh, what about battery life? Well, battery is sealed inside the unit, no more removable backs here, but 3000 milliamps, you're approaching the capacity of phablet there, like the Samsung Galaxy Note 2 has a 3100 milliamp battery. But this is smaller, obviously. It's not 5.5 inches, it's 5.2 inches. Pretty efficient CPU here. They dedicated some RAM just to graphics memory. By the way, you get 2 gigs of RAM inside the phone. And battery life has been actually very good. That's been a sore point for some LG smartphones, that they've often benchmarked a little slower and had slower battery life than they should have. In this case, obviously, it benchmarks fast. It is fast. And battery life has been quite good. I have had absolutely no trouble making it through the day. Even with heavy use, I don't think you can kill this phone in a work day. With normal moderate use, I'm certainly going up to two days on a charge. And if you're doing something like streaming a lot of video, if you're playing 3D games, you're doing a lot of real racing, you're using mucho GPS navigation, you will get shorter run times. You're not going to hit two full days doing that kind of thing. But uh, generally speaking, this is moving in the right direction. I have to say, just like the Moto X where they paid attention to battery life, we need our phones to last longer. That's an important thing, and that's exactly what this is doing. And by the way, that was on LTE all the time, AT&T's LTE network, so we're using the most demanding cellular radio, radio there, and with some Wi-Fi on and off as well to do things like download lots of apps from Google Play. 
Just in case the 5.2 inch Full HD display, quad core 2.26 gigahertz CPU, 2 gigs of RAM, stuff like that wasn't enough to impress you, that 13 megapixel camera on the back. You have a 2.1 megapixel camera in the front that can shoot 1080p video. You get certainly better than average Skype video call quality on that. We have Wi-Fi 802.11b, GN, and AC, just like our Galaxy S4 and our HTC One. Again, you got the latest for wireless there. Not, probably not many of you have AC routers yet, but it's nice to know that if you get one, it will work with that for even faster Wi-Fi speeds. It has 32 gigs of internal storage, NFC, usual GPS, Bluetooth 4.0 LE. Claimed talk time is 17.9 hours. Whoa, that's a lot of talking, isn't it? It's not a very heavy phone either. It's 5.04 ounces, so yes, it may be large, but just like the Samsung Galaxy S4 again, they know how to keep it light. Not too, too thick as you can see here. It's 0.35 inches, so just barely over a third of an inch thick. 5.45 inches tall. It's on the tall side, as most of these Tier 1 Android phones are these days. And it can do, do dual video recording. So again, like the Samsung Galaxy S4, you can record from the front and rear cameras simultaneously if you like. Now for a size comparison, we have it with the Samsung Galaxy S4, obviously in white. You can see very similar thickness right there. You know, we pick on Samsung also for making plasticky, shiny phones, but I would say that they get the style nod here. At least they have this trim ring on the edge. It makes it look a little more snazzy, maybe. The LG is certainly pretty dull looking, isn't it? But they're like exactly the same size. So I'll score one for LG since they have a bigger display. Now we have our classy HTC One 4.7 inch display. So half an inch smaller diagonally speaking, but they had to make room for the stereo speakers top and bottom, those boom sound speakers. So again, you're looking at about the same size. The HTC One, of course, is a little heavier. It's made of aluminum and polycarbonate. Turn them over and on the back, I think most people would probably say the HTC One is the preferable design right there with its nice classy unibody metal look. And lastly, we have it with the Moto X. This is the stock woven black finish, obviously matte, kind of nice looking. Much smaller phone, 4.7 inches, but the thing about the Moto X is they managed to make a very small ergonomic phone. And when we take a look front ways, you can see the difference in size there. For those of you who like smaller phones, the Moto X is still going to be the way to go if you don't want to give up on your big display. So let's talk about software for a while. This is going to be kind of a long while, folks. There's an awful lot of software on here. Uh, the good thing is a lot of it is actually geared towards you being able to customize the phone in ways that you normally can't with Android, which is already a pretty customizable operating system. But first, we have our app drawer right here, and you can change the icons. That's nothing new for LG and their UI. If you don't like some icons, you can actually change them. Otherwise, you've got a pretty much standard side swipe with your background always showing on there. That's nothing too unusual. Obviously, we don't have hardware buttons here. We have on-screen buttons. Uh-huh. What if you don't like those buttons? First off, notifications. A whole lot of stuff going on here, kind of like Samsung. We have a whole bunch of, you can scroll through these sideways, on off for your radios, all sorts of control. We have Q-Slide apps. We'll get into that in a minute. That's not new for LG either. And we've got brightness control over here, phone ringer control. And if I tap that one, we get even more of those independent volume controls. But let's go back to all settings. So here we have, it's like uh, the Samsung Galaxy S4, we've got tab settings here, network, sound, display, general. Notice front touch buttons right here. How do you like your front touch buttons? You take it, take your pick right here. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? You can even add in things like tap here, add that button for, to get a quick access to your notification drawer. Or if you like QMemo a lot, which is their available everywhere memo and screenshot app, you can have that available as a button on the bottom. Pretty wild. For the home screen, you can, of course, set your wallpaper. You can set the swiping effect when you see the scrolling of the screens. You can customize your home screens also. We'll get into that in a bit. You can have portrait view only, which is on by default, or you can have the home screen work in portrait and landscape view. And while we're on the front here, you can do the old press and hold to do stuff, but you can also pinch in. And you can add home screens up to six right there. You can pick which home screen is your main home screen. You can get to your home screens quickly. So you just want to go to that one like that. And you saw the swipe out. That's the one that just turns it into a photo frame of sorts.
You can create folders. That's nothing new in Android. You can also set the color. Like I've made my games folder pink. Isn't that cute? And if you don't want an application on your home screen anymore, you just drag it and take it up here. And this turns into a little trash can door. See that right there? It goes sound effects and all. So a lot of little cute UI customizations here, but they don't slow down the phone. But wait, there's more. As I mentioned, there's your smart screen, there's your smart video right there that, that's based on whether or not you're looking at the phone. So you can control when your screen goes on and off. We've got quiet mode here, so the phone won't bug you in the middle of the night, which is always handy. We have ringtones, smart ringtones. We have the ability, like I said, to bring it up to your ear and have it answer the phone. You can turn the face, phone face down to silence the ringer. Uh, by the way, this comes with some creepy ringtones. They use the Vienna Boys Choir. Now, I like choir just fine. I like classical music. But there's something eerie about having little boys singing things like Life is Good for LG as your default messaging alert sound. It creeped me out the first time my pocket started singing with the voices of little boy choir. You can turn voice notifications on and off. Notice the 3D style skeuomorphistic toggle thing that's going on over here. You can control your haptic feedback. You can control your notification sound. You can set whether the LED notification light is on or not. For the gestures I was talking about, like answering by pulling up to your head, you can do that too. There's, there's also more gestures. You can actually do a three-finger swipe to hide an application away and then do a three-finger swipe in the other direction on screen to bring it back up again. Sort of a new way of doing multitasking. That's called slide-aside. We've got one-handed operation that does the usual thing, moves the dialer to your choice of the right or left-hand side and some other things to make it a little easier to use. Also shrinks the keyboard since it's kind of, well, a large phone, of course. One thing you'll all want to know about, see this here browser bar? You won't find that setting actually inside the standard WebKit web browser, but that's where you go if you want to turn off AT&T's annoying little additional browser bar that has a bunch of social networking and other stuff on there. Another feature that I really, really like, I want this on all phones. It's particularly useful for this since there's no power button on the side or the top of the phone. You don't want to have to turn it over just to look where see where the power button is to turn it on and off. You can set it to respond to, I'll turn it off. Tap firmly in the center. It works every time. I really love this feature. So it's just laying on the desk. I want to look at it quickly. It's not as good as Motorola's active notifications where you just move the phone a little bit and it shows you if there's any alerts or anything like that. But still, this is just so useful. It should be turned on by default. It's not. If you get one, turn it on. And there's even more stuff. You can go ahead and customize the app drawer like here to go crazy if you want to. We won't cover every single thing because this will be a two-hour review. For our widget selection, we have many different kinds of clocks to choose from here. You can choose what clocks appear on your home screen, on your sleep screen as well. The rest of it is pretty much normal stuff. AT&T stuff, calendar, email, directions, Gmail, Google Play, music. A little notepad widget, that one's kind of handy. Notebook as well. Polaris shortcut. Now, in terms of applications on here, you've got a bunch of AT&T stuff. No surprise there. Hello, bloatware. Some of them are kind of handy sometimes, like the barcode scanner for 3D barcode scanning. We have AT&T Drive Mode, AT&T Family Map, AT&T Locker, AT&T Navigator, AT&T Ready to Go, AT&T Smart Wi-Fi. We have a battery manager. That one's kind of handy. Kindle's preloaded on here. I don't think a lot of people are going to mind that too, too much. Both Chrome and the WebKit web browser. The reason I like having the WebKit web browser here is because you can sideload Adobe Flash. I did that. It works. I played games on Congregate. Woohoo! So for those of you who still need Flash, Facebook's preloaded on there. They have a pretty capable file manager. You can, of course, download your own from Google Play Store, but that's nice to have. Shortcut to Wild Tangent Games. God, we can't escape those, can we? Usual full suite of Google apps, Google+, Plus, Gmail, navigation, maps, you know, all that stuff is on board as well. Full version of Polaris Office is here. That's nice. So you can view, edit, and create MS Office files. Quick remote. Aha! Uh -huh. What would a phone be without an IR remote, right? That's, that's the thing these days. Pretty easy to set this up. It walks you through setting all your remotes. You can create several rooms, up to five right there. 
and you can see we've set up our Blu-ray player, our cable box, and if you want to add a new device, just play, press that plus button. Pretty easy to find, and these are the things you can do. TV, your AV receiver, your cable box, your DVD player, your Blu-ray player, your projector, hmm, and your air conditioner. Both Samsung and LG like being able to control your air conditioner. Works pretty well. Teeny IR window up here. I, you have to aim it pretty well. It's not a giant window. In fact, it's just about impossible to see on the black model of this. Probably more obvious if you get the white one. And in terms of applications, there's a little bit more you can do with multitasking, too. Unlike Samsung's split-screen kind of thing going on, they have QSlide apps. That's been around a while for LG, and you can see you can choose from these applications, videos. You can have the floating video player, just like on the Samsung, with transparency, resizable. Your phone, your messaging, your calendar, your email, your notepad, your file manager, your voice control. We'll talk about that in a minute. Calculator as well. So I just tap on one of those, and there it is, little floating applications. I find this sometimes a little bit more handy, actually, than split screen, because some things, well, they have kind of more like widgets on Mac OS or Windows. You can have up to two of these going at once, and when you're done with it, you just click it away. So here we have a video playing. You folks will probably recognize it. So say you want to have it floating. There it is, your floating video player. And you can resize that, move it around. It'll stay on your home screen. There it is, still playing right now. You can even set the transparency on this if you want by dragging the slider. You don't want it to be quite so visible. You get the idea. Floating video player. You see our little bath toy there. You know that means it's camera testing time. There's a lot to talk about here with the camera. My goodness, there's all sorts of settings and features. Uh, and you're going to recognize some of these from Sony because it has a 13 megapixel Sony X more RS sensor inside. And some of the same software features are here like intelligent auto mode. Besides that, it can do HDR, VR panorama, you know, you, you move it around, try to do a 360, it's, it's okay, it's a little finicky like most smartphones. Burst mode is even manual focus if you want with the slider. The intelligent auto mode that I use most of the time, it actually does a pretty good job. It has audio zoom where you actually tell it who's, which speaker to actually try to pick up audio from more clearly. Can shoot 1080p video up to 60 frames per second as well and has optical image stabilization. That's a lot of stuff. Right now, the initial UI looks pretty simple, but if you want to get to more settings, we're in normal mode right now, so that gives us access to all settings. If you choose Intelligent Auto, it's managing a lot of things for you, so some options will disappear. Obviously, that's how you swap your camera. You can control your flash, switch between photo and video. All obvious. There's your camera button. You can also use the rear buttons for shooting and for focusing, for zooming, rather. And if we tap on this, you can see all sorts of things you can set. You can have your cheese shutter, so say cheese, and it'll take the picture your EV focus mode, image size, we're going up to 13 megapixel at 4 by 3 aspect ratio here, color balance, white balance, ISO, auto review, shutter sound, using the volume key if you wish for capture, you get the idea. For modes, there's a whole lot of modes here. And you can see it's doing a matrix focusing there, a large area, which is pretty neat. We have normal, shot and clear, that's in case you got people photobombing. HDR mode, panorama mode, VR panorama, burst mode, beauty shot, it softens those skin tones up, night mode, sports, intelligent auto, where it figures out for you which of those modes would be the best. Dual camera mode as well, if you want to shoot with both cameras simultaneously. So you can see the focusing grid it's using by itself is a fairly wide focusing grid. Shot time is very fast. Let's try HDR mode because that's normally the thing that's slower. So we're going to put it on HDR mode. And that was pretty quick processing time. It's actually faster than my Sony digital SLR camera at processing HDR. So not too bad there. So how did the photos and videos look? Let's take a ch check and see. It's some of the things that we've shot. Not so exciting there to look at our little bath toy, but there's the picture that took of the bath toy. Macro mode. Now that's one thing. If you're using autofocus, it actually does not figure out macro mode. And macro mode means I was about two inches away from the subject that I was shooting. That's something you expect to be able to do with a real camera. And it did a nice job. Look at that. Nice colors. Decent bokeh even. And here it was end of day, but look at the delicate detail there, and no blooming on the yellows. That's 
that's just nice. It's a very nice camera. Farther away shots, normal focusing mode, lots of detail, but not hideously over sharpened on the leaves. Handles reflective surfaces pretty well. The silver car is a little hard. This is an end of day shot right here, but captures some nice texture and warmth of tone right there. Indoor shots of some cupcakes under kind of annoying fluorescent lighting. A little whiting out there, and that's more of a challenging thing to take a picture of. And there we have a salad bar. Ooh, indoor salad bar. And lastly, here's a video that is shot 1080p, 30 frames per second. And it's looking quite good. Yes, it does record audio, but I was not saying anything terribly interesting. That's very nice. The optical image stabilization did a nice there job there of keeping it very smooth. The colors are also nice. The detail is good. No blockiness. Excellent camera. The phone also comes with its own voice command software, or you can use Google Now if you want. Google Now does do an excellent job. This one can stay resonant and always be listening to you. You can do fairly natural language queries with this. Like I said, you can have it always listening. The wake up command is either LG Mobile or Hello Genie, like the genie in a bottle. Either one is kind of, well, not really what you'd be dying to say, but what can you do? That's the state of the art right now. So let's have it check something for us. What's Apple's stock price? So that works. You can also use it for more practical things too, launching applications, that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the, the benefit of using this over Google now is that you can have it always running. Like I said, if, if you have it set to listen to that special command, you can actually just launch it or otherwise just tap the button on the screen there. Works better than S Voice on the Samsung Galaxy S4. Um, not up there with, still with the Moto X with its always on voice command. And here's the on-screen keyboard. Again, I really like that. I love it when you get a dedicated number row right there. It's a good use of space, and even if you're in portrait mode, you still have it as well. Nice, easy to use, well-separated keys, enjoying it. And of course, you can use the voice command input just by pressing the microphone. And here we are. We're on our own web page, AT&T's LTE network working well for us. The whites are nice and white. Really nice screen. Great for reading. Pinch and zooming is responsive. And you can see here's our soft keys. LG chooses to keep them segregated with a line over here, so it's pretty obvious as to where they are at all times. And we'll check out a video. So you can hear the speaker. The speaker fires from the bottom here. They did it like they did with the iPhone 5. There's two grills. You might think it's stereo speakers, but it's not. That's just a mono speaker down there. It's an okay speaker, States nothing to write home about though. And we're on full screen. And if you go to the store, you can get it, well, like we did right here, we have the standard black. Definitely a great screen for watching video. Really nice, that edge to edge experience, and so big and it's just nice. Nice. So how about data speeds? So far they've been as good as ever. Dallas area has very good AT&T LTE 4G coverage. And there you go. It's pretty much par for the course in our area. Going up to 17 megabit per second down and matching that for up speeds. And you can see our other results. All quite good. The only time we had a bad result was when I was in a different area that didn't have very good coverage right there. So great for data. Also very nice call quality. Nice, loud, clear calls. A little bit better volume than average. Um, incoming and outgoing voice, very good. It's right up there with the Samsung Galaxy S4 and the HTC One as excellent voice phones. We're going to play Riptide GP2. Look at that. Isn't that just nice looking? Look at all the detail. Look at the water effects right there. 
Nice. Plays very smoothly. Excellent frame rates here. Accelerometer is also very nice. Not overly twitchy on this. Doing pretty well with it. Now your hand does tend to cover the end when you're playing games, so your sound gets muffled. That's one thing I'm not so thrilled with about the design of the phone. Ooh, dumped him. So that's Riptide GP2. And then we're testing out Dead Trigger. And you can see how good the frame rates are in it. We've got some part little particles floating around. We're getting some of those nice little value added you used to have to have a Tegra for. It's just looking really good. Lots of detail on the floor and everywhere else. Very nice screen. You get the idea. We're shooting lots of zombies and it looks beautiful too. Let's run away from them and see some more environment. Looking very nice. So that's Dead Trigger. So that's the LG G2. It's available now on both AT&T and Verizon coming to other carriers as well. And honestly, there's a lot of nice smartphones out right now on those carriers. Just even looking at Android models alone, it's going to be hard to pick. But I can tell you, you're not going to go wrong with this guy. Really, really stunning display. Obviously, one of the biggest displays on the market for a phone in this size class. Excellent camera, long battery life. Like it a lot. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review of the LG G2. And don't forget to hit that like button.